<laughs> you sit there. I'll be all over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. It's come. Very good. Okay. okay thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Frederick, for this uh, introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Kenneth Bonilson. I know some of you here. There are friends I've been looking forward to seeing after a long time. Also, uh, new faces here. So thank you so much all for coming. This is pumping indeed. Um, if I may just begin with a short anecdote. Uh, my son Thomas is sitting in the corner over there uh, looking at his, his phone. We, we landed here a couple of days back and then we drove from uh, Dabuli uh, in the middle of the night to where we're staying now and then he was quite awake having slept a good deal on the plane and coming here and he was looking out on the landscape uh, driving along. And then uh, he saw a sign on the roadside and he read it as we were passing by and he said, uh, Dad, this, uh, what does this sign uh, mean? And then I told him, well, it says uh, this property is not for sale. And then he said, Dad, I know I can read English. But I, I asked, what does it mean? And I said, well, it means the person who owns this property uh, is not going to sell it. And then he said, yes, I know, but why does he have to put a sign on this property saying that this is not for sale? Back home we do it the other way around. If there are things we want to sell, then we put up a sign. If there's no sign, we assume that things are not for sale. And I think that, that kind of nicely sort of sums up the um, forms of land commodification going on where um, the demand for certain plots of land is such that um, it's almost assumed that various plots of land are accessible on the market if only the price is right. And I think that was, in a sense, uh, kind of illustrative of, of some of the things that we are discussing also in, in this book. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a compilation of articles and book chapters written, uh, I think, over the past 15 years. Uh, some jointly, uh, some individually, by Solano, some by me, and some by Heather Plumbridge Baby, who isn't here, but who also has um, her PhD research carried out in Goa uh, around 2006-2007. And um, this research that we've done now over a decade and a half individually and jointly has, has all been done land issues. Uh, Solano's mostly on land use planning and planning processes and forms of planning. Uh, Heather's on special economic zones in particular. My own more focused on infrastructure, perhaps especially the uh, new airport that's recently opened up in North Goa after many, many years of uh, controversy over uh, its faith and, and destiny. Um, so based on these very many individual studies, I think we began to see uh, a larger pat pattern emerging, a pattern which I am sure is also familiar to everyone who sits in this room, where we have seen now over many, many years uh, various uh, government agencies, individual politicians and bureaucrats, acting in various forms of collaboration with private corporations to either acquire or to appropriate tracts of land across the state uh, for a range of different projects in very many different sectors from uh, industries uh, to real estate uh, to mining to infrastructure and of course also related to tourism development. Uh, these are processes we think that follow a certain pattern where we see land changing hands at different scales through different means uh, from communities and individuals and often into commercial ventures of one sort or the other. And we decided that uh, something like the great Goa land grab might be at least a catchy title, but also perhaps a not too inaccurate descriptor of what we think has been happening. Uh, this is not to say that there's been such a thing as a singular process of land transformation, uh, it's been arguably more complex than that, and many of the chapters go into some of these complexities and the different actors and scales at work in either uh, dispossessing communities of land or in other ways commodifying land, uh, freeing it up for the market, 
putting it on the market where it can be bought and sold for a profit or where it can be used for various forms of event extraction. Um, so before I hand over to Solano to um, give us a little bit more detail about some of the chapters, um, just to say that the introduction to the book, uh, in a sense, tries to present a, a political economic argument of sorts, where we identify different factors and different processes that have increased the pressure on land in Goa, which has led some people to put up signs of their properties of the kind that Thomas bought it on the way from the airport. Um, and one can read more about these processes in the book itself, also in the chapters that follow, but just to briefly highlight some of these driving factors, it includes the gradual decline of agriculture across many years in the state, also of course the mining in the hinterlands, laying claims to large tracts of land, uh, tourism along the coastline and in other areas, and of course real estate projects in many places, not the least focused uh, for or driven by the demand and desire for a second home in Goa. Um, following this, the book then has 10 chapters that, as I said, all began life as individual articles. They can, for this reason, if one wants to, be read in uh, an order of one's own choice, in random order. They are written and designed as uh, standalone pieces, hopefully with a coherent and neat argument in each of the chapters that uh, follow. Some of them are focused on what we may call land grabbing, where indeed force and coercion plays a considerable role. But there are also many chapters that focus on more insidious ways of commodifying land and rendering as it as an investable object. Uh, what one might call uh, land grabbing by stealth or land commodification by more insidious means. And I'll now hand over to um, Solano to say more about one of these forms of land commodification that we write quite substantially about in, in some of the middle sections of the book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm I must say at the outset, my personal involvement in this has been because of the questions that were raised in the classes with Professor Peter. One of the things he used to tell us was if we want to understand politics in Goa, we should look at the political economy of land. And uh, I witnessed this firsthand after the regional plan, the 2011 plan, where sort of hills that uh, Aaron and I, uh, my, my childhood friend, would walk on in Pilang, were up in flames and burning, and, and ash even flying right up to where we stay, animals running into people's homes, people breaking down and crying in front of the Saule Lake, you know, Father Maverick coming and just weeping there, seeing kids going, no understanding how this was happening. This was more of a personal story. And then my engagement with Ritu and Patricia, who are here with us, literally brought me into the context of the empirical understanding on the ground to, to sort of engage with this question. Before this, I really didn't have much of an interest uh, in that. So coming back to this book and to speak uh, about the more insidious ways in which land is commodified and grabbed, I want to just stretch out briefly a few uh, sets of uh, premises and going into the arguments, some of the key findings, before I come to the key findings. So one of the things that, as Kenneth has already said, post-colonial Goa, after the Toshi's liberation, has witnessed a dramatic uh, transformation in its economy. And this has led to certain pressures, translated to certain new pressures on land. And this we, we, we pretty much know. And there is almost a geographical a way in which we can delineate uh, these pressures being translated on ground. For example, along the coastline, along the coast you have tourism and real estate and footprint very strongly there. Towards the Midlands, when you had uh, uh, governments, post-colonial governments, taking initiatives to set up industrial estates, you have that impact on the Midlands. And of course, mining, which began just a few years before uh, before the Portuguese liberation in the hinterland. So all of these are the three 
different zones and three different kinds of economic drivers that translate uh, to the way in which land is used. And this comes in, in conflict with other land uses, namely agricultural land uses and also forests. So they, they come in conflict. So we, we try to stretch this out a bit in the, in the book. This also brings us to understand why we have planning in the first place and why it was initiated as early in the 1970s and 80s. Goa was one of the premier states to do, to, to be one of the pioneers to do this for the entire state. Because it was realized early on in the 1970s itself that the pressures, the economic drivers in Goa were so powerful and we were set with a very small state. And we have to manage this in a judicious manner. Mining in the, in the hinterland, industrial estates being set up to create employment, etc. And on the coast, there was, there was tourism being taken, starting to take off with you know, concerted efforts. How do we manage this? The TCP department was set up, Professor Edgar Vero was put in charge of, of this and uh, still with us. And he has some fascinating stories about how this is done. This is, as we speak, uh, Fernando Bello is documenting the work that has gone. Uh, in and is doing it in a very uh, audio-visual mode. We look forward to that work. When we read the regional plans, which are one of the best expressions how land is managed in Goa, we find that, that we find a certain pattern. There is an attempt to balance three things. Grow the economy, promote agriculture, and safeguard the environment. These three things are consistent in all the in all the regional plans. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying simplifying this, but we find this. So how do we do this? We come up with a we come up with a policy document that says this is the kind of Goa we want ten years, fifteen years ahead. And when we have that vision, how does that vision have to have that vision has to be translated in how we use land. So this translates from the regional plans, which are a policy document, to zoning plans, which are, in one case, the regional plan, and the cities, the ODPs. Okay, now these zoning plans is where the big controversy is. One of the things uh, our work has found is that there is a big difference, as Professor Peter would tell us, to look between the promise and the reality. So the the policy documents are some of them are fantastic, great to look at. But when we look at the zoning plans, or whatever we were able to make sense of it, we find that the zoning plans go in a totally different direction. Okay, this, and some we have even attempted in some ways to even track, for example, how is agricultural zoning? If we just look at the zoning of agriculture, we track them right from the eighties onwards. Uh, have we promoted it? If we have promoted it, we should have at least had it at, at par, the same levels at which we were zoning it in the 1980s, but we find gross dips in this. And there could be errors with our data, but it's open for a conversation. The other thing that we have, we have, we have observed this interesting pattern where one arm of the government gives plans, creates plans, with all these promises to balance the uh, and a plan has to be made legitimate to the public, and the public has to be convinced that it's, it will grow the economy, it will simultaneously promote agriculture, and it will simultaneously protect the environment. But in the actual, there is another arm of the government that seems to undo, create a whole set of loopholes to undo the very regional plan. So we have these strange amendments coming out that say, if the regional plan is, this is a caveat out of it. If, it is, this, if, the, if there is one law that exists that is protecting some point plot of land, this is another law that allows you to get exemption from it. And we have noticed this in practice, and this is one of the key findings in our work. When it comes to the ODPs, the planning has been ad hoc, but this is not well developed in the book. We plan to do this subsequently. The other thing is the phenomena of social movements. Some of them with spectacular results. Kenneth himself would say that one of the things that brought him from studying Bengal to Goa was to was the witness of some spectacular reversals, like the regional plan, the ACZs, the case with mining, Rahul Boss will stay with us. All of these uh, have also foregrounded, let us not forget, the spectacular results for which Goa and, and how social movements in Goa have attracted a lot of scholarship. 
the last point uh, that we are yet to develop, and it also takes, uh, takes it hopes to take forward conversations with Professor Peter, is um, we find an interesting pattern that land-related, land-related um, uh, portfolios, any land-related portfolios, whether they are PDAs or they are TCP ministership, is very prominent. They are that. This is a claim I'm going to make. They are the cement that keeps defections in place. We see, we witness defections, but if we map where the defectors, how they are accommodated, what lures them, and and what keeps them, you will invariably find that it is a land-related ministry. For example, if you look at the PDAs today, which make ODPs which are completely dealing from smart city and the municipality, completely dealing. So you can have the best smart city projects, but the way in which our city's land is going to be used is determined entirely by a PDA. They're all held by political offices. And the TCP ministership itself is used to keep a political defector in place and to lure and reward. And this won't, I mean, I think this is a piece of work that uh, in, we were having a conversation that we need to map in order for us to explain the phenomena of defections that is so rife in Goa. How does it happen? It comes back to the hypothesis that Professor Peter used to tell us. Look at how land is, look at the story of land and all of this. And yeah, I, I just want to end with that. Just to, to follow up very briefly before we, we conclude, it's true that um, at the time of 2006-2007, uh, those years, uh, I, I spent a significant amount of my life in West Bengal um, for my own PhD research, which was in Shingur, um, a part of India that's now well known for being the home of what used to be a car factory, but which is now no more a car factory, where a car would have produced that had been produced that is now also no longer in production, namely the Tata Nano. Uh, the place became famous for a long drawn out uh, conflict over land that was being forcibly acquired from local farmers there. And that was my PhD research, and I was, was living there for a year, year and a half um, in those days, which were also the, the days of Mundi Gum and uh, the similar special economic zones controversies there. And uh, the concluding section of, of our book has, I think, a full four chapters on, on special economic zones in Goa. And we did discuss, uh, is, is anybody going to be interested in reading this these days? I mean, this is uh, 15 years ago. Uh, isn't uh, special economic zones a thing of the past? I mean, they were so controversial uh, in this country that both the governments and investors quickly backtrack on, on, on the idea and they, they became very unpopular uh, and and have been in a sense off the policy table for, for quite a while um, because of these controversies over land acquisitions. Uh, but then we, we decided to include these chapters nonetheless for for different reasons and one was um, uh, actually by chance I, I, I teach development studies now and then and I, I have an annual lecture that I do for my students every year which is on the global land grab debate or with examples from India and, and China and when I was preparing for this last time I suddenly discovered that there's now um, a new global alliance of special economic zones uh, with uh, members representing over 7,000 special economic zones uh, scattered across 145 different countries. Uh, and that continues to work to promote special economic zones as a tool, and now I quote from their webpage, for reaching the goals of sustainable development. So now we have special economic zones that used to be all about jobs and growth being repackaged uh, as being all about sustainable development, something that we can recognize immediately as greenwashing, uh, but which nonetheless is a way of, of reinventing this idea of enclave economies as a way of realizing economic and political goals that happen to be in fashion at a particular moment in time. And we also noted that uh, in, in last year's Union Budget speech for 2022, um, the Finance Minister also spoke about replacing India's uh, SEZ Act with uh, 
I mean, so-called the development of enterprise and services hubs as a way of, if not reinvigorating, then reinventing this idea of having uh, these enclave economies as um, as engines of Indian capitalism, you may say. Um, and uh, the idea of including these chapters on special economic zones is that if they make a comeback, locally or globally, I, we are fairly certain that many of the conflicts and controversies that accompanied them 15, 20 years ago will, will, make, a, will make a comeback in this context too. Um, so we have them there also as chronicles of these social movements and popular struggles which were uh, very much more successful here than in, in many other parts of India. Uh, so they are there, I think, just as much uh, as, as chronicles of past struggles, which may um, be with us also when, when we look ahead uh, and what might be on, on the horizon of, of future conflicts over land, uh, not just here, but in India more, more widely. If I, and, could, uh, if I could just uh, come in. Uh, professor, I get the impression that uh, since since you are so close to the subject, uh, you will have taken us into the deep end of the pool, and we are getting a little bit lost about the wider picture. Sorry. So no, no, it's fine. So just two questions. The first is I like the point you make that land grabs are not unique to Goa or not even to India, perhaps. So maybe you could put that in context. And the second is an overview of the book. Uh, you know what it contains, what you looked at. And what was its its goal in that sense? Well, I mean, well, the first I can do relatively quickly. I mean, there, there's been a um, a long debate on land grabbing as a global phenomenon that that we often trace back to the financial crisis around 2007, 2008. Uh, which uh, saw, I, the, the figures elude me, but uh, which saw a very large number, of millions of hectares of land changing hands uh, across the globe. Uh, in Africa, on a large scale, uh, also Latin America, uh, but also in China, and also in South Asia. And there are some variations in, in the ways in which land was grabbed, and the purposes for which land was transferred from, or which, uh, through which land ownership changed hands. It was often for uh, agricultural and food production uh, in Africa and also Latin America, which had to do with also the spike in food prices around the same time, 2007 8, 9. In contrast, what we saw in China and also India was uh, largely ha land changing hands for purposes of uh, industrialization in name, but also in practice for real estate development. Uh, so all the, these differences, I mean, we have a global phenomenon, but many of these regional differences we see have much to do with more regional or local political economies, which is why uh, the, the land that changed hands in India did so for, for different purposes. I mean, real estate as one huge growth sector, but also, uh, also um, industries to some extent. Um, as for the book itself, uh, Solana, do you have the, the table of contents in mind? <laughs> Yeah, I think we have been through uh, through most of the of the chapters. I don't think we've forgotten anything. I mean, we do have some discussion also on environmental impact assessment reports, but that's perhaps a little bit more um, detailed or more technical. I, I think on that note, maybe we should shift mode to a more yeah. conversational format. Yeah. Take, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, it's open to anyone. Just request, uh, make your question. You can have a comment also, observation, no problem. Just introduce yourself very briefly. I'm Frederick Kaldi. Uh, anyone who would like to interact, feel free. Yeah. There was this other book come out recently, uh, Ajit Goa's Gajar Politics, and that also revolved around banding. Uh, how do the two books connect? I just have one. Uh, there is one chapter on specifically looking at, at land. One of the things that mirrored uh, what some of the pieces of work that we had done was on the 16B 
controversy, for example, what Sandesh seems to have done is actually name politicians, etc., who have benefited from this amendment that was recently brought that undoes uh, the regional plan. It was introduced by Vijay Sardasan and, uh, and it has been kept in place by the very uh, subsequently DCP ministership was, was changed uh, to Kaulekar, who opposed that amendment and even warned of a court case, but then as DCP ministership, he continued with that. Some of the number crunching we've done for uh, Claude has put in a petition. Sandesh has actually gone and named politicians directly, and, uh, and, he, and he says uh, it's so clearly uh, sort of linked to political. That part I took from uh, I must confess I'm only two thirds uh, through uh, that book, um, which I, which we've been very inspired by, and and I think I think one can read them um, not as competing books but as as uh, companions in a sense. Um, that book is uh, very broad in sweep. Um, uh, that, that's that's my reading of it. Uh, it covers. Um, uh, an enormous time span. Uh, ours is, I, I think, to be honest, much narrower. It's, yes. it's, uh, it's more or less exclusively about the past 15, 20 years. Uh, probably from a more sort of um, insistent political economy perspective. Uh, but, but I think that's why it makes maybe good sense to read them as companions, because ours is quite narrow. Uh, we, we don't offer that big picture that you will find in, in the other book. But you think the messages are similar? Well, I think we largely align. Huh? Um, I mean, we. I, I would say so. I mean, perhaps we are a little bit. We write in a different tone, I might say. Um, if, if that clarifies uh, the, also some of the sort of genre differences. Huh? But, but I think in terms of uh, the essence of the arguments, I, I don't think we are. Uh, too much of a disagreement. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to begin by uh, congratulating Kenneth Solano and Rico for bringing out this book and thanking you for initiating what I think will be a very important debate. Uh, several times in Solano's presentation, he referred to some uh, fictional le lectures I gave about land. So let me, let, me just, uh, let, let me just sort of summarize uh, you know, what I was trying to say over, the, over those years, many years ago. Uh, and in a sense, I'd like to place this book uh, within, that, within that picture. I think, I think there, is, there is an argument above the book, which the book would need to engage with. And there's an argument below the book. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? I mean, the, argue, the book, I have not read the book, so I mean, based on what has just been presented, I think it's important to say, and, and this links with what I've been talking about, that what we are witnessing is, is a transformation in the nature of land. So you, you detail a lot of cases, but there's a transformation in the nature of land, and if, if I may put it somewhat simply, land has moved from being an instrument of production, you know, something we learn, to a commodity. You mentioned it as a commodity. So what you're seeing is the emergence of land as a commodity. So instrument to commodity. Yeah. And, and as a commodity, now it becomes available for sale. It has no other value as production. It has no other value as agriculture or horticulture or culture. It is now just a commodity for sale in a market that has emerged. So if you have to go above the book, you have to you have to detail the emerging market in land. You have to do I have more than a few minutes? Sure, sure, yeah. of course. Uh, if you to detail the emerging market in land, you have to look at the drivers of that market. Driver number one is the transformation of the Indian economy, which has produced a lot of surplus, right, which finds its way to Goa. So, so, so the transformation taking place in Goa is because the surplus has emerged in other parts of Goa, uh, of India. And, and then Goa becomes, Goa becomes a place where that, that surplus can be invested, the emerging market. Second thing about the emerging market is it becomes dominant. Every other institution of Goan society gets corrupted by this market. Whether it is church, whether it is family, 
whether it is local government, whether it is, in other words, the, the, what, what are normally the constraints to this market in terms of personal and public assets. Uh, the life world. Yeah, see, uh, those, those constraints uh, do not occur. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, so the point I want to make is just mapping this market and seeing its impact on every institution in society, both social and political. So, so you're saying every other institution, every family, institution. church, even, those even your personal, have... even your personal ethics, even my personal, yeah, is under is under pressure. So this yeah. needs to be mapped because this is the picture that is taking place above your case studies. Below your case studies, I think you, you, you very very interestingly identified a set of zones, as he said planning, etc. But you must see the impact of this market on the institutions of society. So you need, the, at the lower level, you need to do a lot of anthropological studies. And I'm, I'm pleased that uh, Professor Nielsen is a social anthropologist, which means that we need a lot of case studies. What happens to the you know, uh, land registry office? How, do, how, how, does, how does, for example, some students of mine years back came up with the observation that panchayats in the coastal areas uh, were dependent on the market, so they were, they were not bothered about, the NOCs were easily given. Panchayats in the hinterland uh, were dependent on government grants, okay. so their functioning was different. So you need to do a lot of case studies. So I, I mean, I just want to conclude by saying that I'm absolutely delighted with this study. I'm absolutely delighted that I would see it as as being a program, not just a study. So if you abandon this, abandon the research after this book, we will be very disappointed. If you believe, if you elevate it to a program, uh, and, and in that program, because really, if you have to understand Goa today, everything, you know, from urban planning to so, so to, it's a mistake to think that all these deficiencies and pathologies you see are are a result of bad planning or special interests, that's a certain, that's a certain meso level. You have to go to the meta level. Uh, it is the market in land. And unless you understand, and the market in land in Goa is different from markets everywhere else. Because there's a lot of land everywhere. Here, here the people who are bringing in money are people who have special access to state power. So, so the state is missing in, you know, you have to build, bring the state into the narrative. Uh, so you have to look at the market, you have to look at the state, and you have to look at society. Sorry, I, I was a little, I was a little extensive, but I think so. Thank I was to blame for the first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I fully take blame. Thank you. Yeah, can I just, I mean, I'll pass it on very soon, but just thank you so much for these, uh, these comments and. Um, as an anthropologist, I of course agree particularly with um, your point about the need for, for I mean, grounded studies of these dynamics. Uh, um, two books, I, I've been rereading Polani recently on, on the great transformation and the commodification of land and um, it's, uh, it's that, that bigger process that, uh, that I think these chapters need to be set within even if we don't set that context for the reader, hopefully the reader will somehow find a way of having that context uh, in, in mind. Um, and I keep on returning to this sign saying this property is not for sale. I mean, these sort of uh, feeble, almost desperate attempts at, at decommodification from below, huh? that you have to signal whenever things are not on the market. I think that's... Uh, uh, that's, uh, I mean, as an anthropologist, that uh, that's one of these sort of stray observations that suddenly becomes significant now. And when you have to, when you have to flag your decommodification of uh, things that happen to be in your possession, uh, that, that that says something about uh, social relations, but also bigger market structures. And of course, I mean, with, with Polan is thinking at thinking about stable market, yes. Uh, yeah. And then <laughs> oh, yeah, I, uh, Cameron here. I'm actually part of like a loose 
um, kind of volunteer group of people who are looking at the Kazans and how Kazan lands are changing, not only in terms of ownership, but also in terms of you know how certain threats are you know and risks are stopping the what they traditionally uh, used to be used for. So my my question is, does your book uh, address how Kazan lands are changing? Because we were thinking maybe do a GIS study of Kazan lands to get an understanding of you know how they changed. Um, did you come across any information about mapping of Kazan lands or, or any information about how, how those the, the, the land use has changed over time in regards to the Kazans? Um, a quick response is, one, the person I normally refer to is Ritu and there's Aaron here as well. I think you know Aaron. But I my, saw my a map, uh, the only time... Sangeeta Sonak's book. Sangeeta Sonak, you know this book by Sangeeta Sonak? Yeah, Sangeeta, Sangeeta Sonak has one book. There are a few other, Aaron may correct me. But in terms of actual mapping, in terms of actual an inventory, I remember seeing one map when the draft of the regional plan was being made. The draft regional plan contained a map that exclusively tried to show the Kazan lands. And the best place would be to directly go to the Department of Agriculture and the WRD. This was a Goa wide. Yeah. This was a Goa wide. Goa wide. Yeah, because it had to be mapped at that time. Yeah. Sorry, Elsa is here. Sorry, Elsa is here. This is the expert. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a cousin society of Goa. Uh, we have a group in which uh, we have a few members who are very active for the cousins of Goa. Um, point which I would want to connect with, of course, uh, there is a pattern related to cousins. Maybe case studies could reveal that. As we were discussing, it also occurred to me that, that, that there could be a pattern in Komilada land as well, in land grabbing, from, from that context. There also could be a pattern from land acquisition that we hear of for supposedly central government projects and all these kind of things across Goa which is happening. That also could be a pattern. Um, so case studies could reveal such a pattern in case. Uh, they are also at the ground level, let me highlight to you, at the village level, uh, there are a lot of open spaces which the village panchayats have never inventorized. There is never a record and a lot of land grabbing is happening there, so much so that the greens at the village level are disappearing. So there is a pattern there as well. So these are three areas, of course, in context of Komnidat, cousins also would get covered because most of the cousins were the heritage systems which our communities created. So there could be a very, very um, clear pattern in all these three areas. And as the uh, professor said, from instrument to commodity is that transition which has happened between these three, Komnidat, um, um, uh, land uh, uh, belonging to open spaces of the people, of the communities and then getting converted into commodities from whichever way, uh, partnership and um, whatever they call it. They call it with a lot of uh, hi-fi names, modern names, but all the same it's getting alienated from the, from the commons. So, yeah, uh, I was wondering whether these case studies also could
for investors from other parts of India as well as abroad. Because it's no laws of pertaining to land are really being followed. And they can be changed, they're very flexible. So I think this was a very interesting article which kind of shows a different perspective of why people are investing in Goa. Yeah. This question takes from what you spoke about uh, money coming in and affecting personal ethics and the church. In particular, uh, with regard to the church, which has agency in the state and owns vast tracts of that, how would, in your view, how would it change the impact or the effect on the church in the, in the coming years, given also the decline in the state's uh, Catholic or Christian population? I think it's a good question for you. So thank you, Susan. Uh, basically, uh, I'm not an academic expert and I'm not familiar with technical jargon. I'm basically a gaunkar of a gumnidar, a farmer. So I would uh, prefer to remit at that. Uh, I thank uh, Solano and uh, his, uh, the other author, Kenneth and Heather also. Uh, for uh, putting together this, uh, it gives us a platform for further discussion. And uh, a lot what Dr. Peter Roni had said, I would agree, the top and the bottom. Having been in politics, active politics myself, having been in the corridors of uh, power, okay, for some time, until I decided uh, to move out and get into local self-governance, I, I don't think in this land grab, basically, is, is such a simple issue. Uh, as a Gaukar, uh, I have been constantly questioning, even pre-liberation, okay, how in a Kumbhida certain affluent or aristocratic people have got vast tracts of land. Because basically uh, there have been even uh, chapel properties or church properties, suddenly the committee has come to know that this particular property is on some other uh, person's name. Okay? And when you go in the archives, you found that some document during Portuguese rule was made and, uh, and, the, and the common people were all the porters and the, the what do you call that, the other, uh, the charis and all these sort of people, artisans uh, in the village who didn't know anything. So these people had access to Portuguese. So the land grab has been taking place. That is how uh, huge chunks of land, person staying in, in my village has chunks of land in Morjim, in, uh, in Markai, Kundai, okay. how come this land from the Komnidats came in the hands of certain people who were known to be very close to the uh, Portuguese regime. So the land grab has been taking place. It has, after liberation, it has evolved into a, a new sort of this thing. First thing, I think, the, the, the first blunder was the Munkar Act. Okay. The, the blanket, uh, what you call that, license to uh, what you call uh, people to snatch land in the name of being underprivileged and under thing. That's where injustice started with the persons who had small parcels of land also. That again made people vulnerable and open to the larger forces that later came on in the 70s and 80s. And then the whole during the 70s and 80s, I think Aaron will be uh, remember how we were fighting the IT park and the industrial estate in Sukur. Okay? Uh, the, whole, the whole fear of acquisition of land, the Land Acquisition Act, okay? where if I did not give my land to the local MLA who was going to come up with some IT park and all, so before, the, uh, before any project comes up, okay? land is already taken at a cheap dirt price. So even before MOPA came up, Pedna has already been bought by people who knew that MOPA would come up. Okay. And today, the, 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 the price will jump six times or seven times. So this land appreciation business has been going on and we need to study that. Uh, I think as a person having been involved in the anti-regional plan and later on even in the anti-mega projects issues, uh, I think there is a lot of nostalgia and, 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 a, and a sort of glorification of this thing. But initially what started off with good intentions was, in my personal opinion, hijacked again by the land mafia in Goa along with the politicians. Okay. And finally, it was powers 
uh, West uh, that were, you know, some powers with the people okay, were taken out. So today my panchayat basically has no powers about what uh, projects will come in my village. The, uh, the technical authority is the TCP okay, and the panchayat is just a licensing authority. And then the whole thing of going to courts and all is a different is a different ball game altogether. So basically, it's a it's a much wider subject. Uh, and as I think Dr. Peter has also said, the deals of land are not made in Goa today. At least this is my uh, uh, the findings after roaming with certain people. Everything is decided in Delhi. Who will get which property? Who will get what? So. The, the whole commands are coming from Delhi, so it has reached to a larger, uh, larger plank altogether. And in this whole thing, the, the debate has remained more with certain people, elite and privileged people. Under privileged, I think we need to also get their feelings uh, or their experiences uh, on paper and, and, and put out in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Huh? No, sorry. No. Yeah, Gerard. Yeah, hi, good evening. I'm Gerard. I'm a journalist. Uh, I wanted to ask you, how would you reconcile the, uh, you know, when there, whenever there is a project, like for example the MOPA airport, there was a lot of opposition, but at the same time when the public hearing was held, a majority of people came out in support of the project saying that we want this, we want the jobs, the promise of jobs. So how do you reconcile this uh, uh, between the two, between the two, the opposition as well as those who come out uh, in support of the project? Last cup of tea. <laughs> anyone left? Anyone left? We'll get more. There's no issue. Last piece of lens for the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> for the speakers. <laughs> no, no, there's time, there's time, there's no hurry. Uh, I'm going to give this to Professor Peter. Uh, uh, Brian. I'm sorry, I, I may be repeating what I've said, but all the specific questions that you have asked, in a sense, relate to the above question that I was raising. We have to do most studies to understand the market in land. A market has emerged and it's a pretty sophisticated market. And in that sophisticated market, you will find these case studies that you're referring to. And you will find the big deal. So, you know, unless we understand the dynamics of this market, and I want to suggest that the dynamics are in place and they're distorting everything. That's, that's, my, that's my, my primary thesis is the dynamics of the market is destroying all institutions in society. Okay, I want to make a strong case because I'm among wonderful friends and some of you may want to do further, further cases. Now, the most powerful, I mean, I'm even saying it distorts the judicial system, okay? So I'm, I'm not, I mean, the judicial system is not about the politics, obviously, because everybody is reduced to being a buyer and a seller in the, in the market. Now, how does it affect, you said, the church? So I'm saying to you, that this is where the case studies come in, right? I have a general argument, and in the general argument, I say that all, all uh, personal ethics, which, which in a sense complicates a buyer-seller relationship, uh, gets undermined by the dynamics of the market. So the market undermines your personal ethics. So law, for example. No, no, there's my a... Brain, my brain. No, no, there's a regional plan, and the regional plan prohibits this. Then as Solano says, but exceptions come. Because the power of the market has distorted the regional plan. That will happen to personal. No, no, we should only sell to Goans. And then somebody will say, but I'll offer you three times the amount. I say, no, no, but you know, it's good. So you will have Portuguese style, style type houses being made available in North Goa. But it's changed the dynamics of the village. I think that will happen in the church as well. Let's look at some look at some so look at some cases and look at them anthropologically. And you will find this is my assumption, cases will you will find that a whole body of arguments will emerge as to why the transaction was valid. And that's my point. There's a rationalization that takes place that justifies the transaction. 
and the transaction is driven by the part of the market. And that part of the market is driven by Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, etc. Builders. I mean, there are agents, but the power, land has emerged as the most powerful commodity today in the Indian market. Everywhere. So there are other cases, SEZs. I, I just want to conclude on one small point because I think that was an important point uh, that came up about you, you. You use the word commons. I, I think I, I think that's a, no, the idea of the commons uh, is is an idea that I don't know if it's been well developed in Goa, but it's such an important idea because the idea of the commons uh, is an idea that comes uh, relating to land from from the United from the UK, where. The commons is land that belongs to the community over which nobody can be excluded and, and nobody, people can enjoy the benefits of it, but it must, they must not leave, leave it in a degraded situation. There are three or four conditions of a commons. Now, uh, yes, there are Goa commons that are being encroached upon, what, what in the UK was called the enclosure movement. Now, I, I, why I, I, your word triggered it off? Is all of us are residents of Panjim, right? And you would say, where is the commons in Panjim? And yet, I have memory of my college days in Panjim, when the riverfront was available to us. It was the commons. We, we, you could walk down the riverfront, sit on the benches and look at the boats and the barges and all. That's not available anymore. The commons of the riverfront have been, have been enclosed right from the bridge. Right from the bridge, where there's a green metal sheet, right up to the market. Even your Miramar beach. No, but what I'm saying is it's just not available. You yep. can't sit by the riverside today. And, and that is not an issue that we think about. But it's exactly the same politics of the market. So the comments have also been privatized. That's, that's the point I wanted to make. If I may just add one more point, I think Solano brought up the issue of these parallel laws that are in, in place. Exceptions. Pardon? Exceptions. Not exceptions. There are, see, on this issue there are laws which will neutralize another law which is in another act. Okay. Uh, and a beautiful game is happening on the sound pollution thing. Where the uh, pollution control board puts on the police, the police puts it on the uh, district magistrate not giving orders and it goes on. And the people are caught in that, you know. So in the same way, uh, is the panchayat who is the licensing authority and finally also all the all the fallouts of the conversions and ever, everything take place it is the panchayat which is pulled up by high court to to clear the garbage and and then the, the panchayat have to pay 50000 60000 is fine and i have been repeatedly telling the sarpanchas you all are not fighting for your rights if you uh, if you don't have if you are not involved in uh, what you call that, changing the land zoning and, and, and creating all this mess, okay, of them finding a place to dump garbage or to segregate garbage, okay, uh, you have taken all this and now when the time comes for the difficult part, the whole onus is put on you and you are not bringing this up before the law. So basically, uh, and these people also, the sarpanchas and all are corrupt, so they also have no face to defend themselves because they are also enjoying a, a part of their cake. And it is going on. So the, the people are, uh, what do you call that, caught in this whole mess. So there is this parallel, uh, parallel governance also. And I would say there is a mafia governance also running parallelly in Goa. I, I have no uh, reservations to say about it. So the government is there just for namesake. There is a parallel government that is, is running off. <laughs> Including uh, religions have also come into this now. So it's industry, religion and, and politicians. The three. Uh, are playing the game. So basically, anyhow, that's a, another thing. But this is my... Uh, Gerard will answer your question. Yeah. Just take a question from Vivek. There's a question um, it's a little bit of a reflection, but actually I, I do think that uh, Sandesh's book is relevant here. And uh, I can't help but think that one of the missing bits in this bit of the conversation that we're having is the third book is by Hartman. You know, Hartman's work also ties in here because Hartman puts the finger on the criminality. So what the one of the things about looking at the systems that work here, according to me, when I'm continually looking at it from my point of view, is that whether it's uh, democracy or market economy even, these things are warped in war by criminal misgovernance. Right? So there's 
there is an interfering criminal misgovernance that takes place, right? So, but you can't you can't even say that this is the market at work because it's not the market at work. I'm I'm trained to look at what how a market would function. This is not a market, right? It's the it is a weird kind of uh, of only or whatever the classification is. I think you require some sophistication to really parse exactly what's happening in the world. It's not it's different from other parts of the world and it is a uh, walk because it is a hot house within India. But I do think also in hearing this conversation one of the things that did occur to me is that it may have it may be the case of entrepots. This may be a historical Anthropo. case. Anthropo, right? This Anthropo. trading center okay. that we are Goa Anthropo. has been historically Anthropo. has been uh, as in, and still is an entrepo. I think that is one way I've always found very useful yes. to think of Goa as a cosmopolitan kind of marketplace. I mean, if you think even a thousand years ago, there were rules and laws, and yes, we had famously the Kadamba, the Kadambas named and had a prime minister. The reason I'm saying these things is because the rules are a little bit twisted when it comes to an entrepo. So these enclaves that you're talking about, uh, enclave economy, they seem to kind of have their own rules. But you know, I think what we're facing right now, really, the X, the big X factor in analyzing all of this, is criminality. One cannot expect even the market to behave rationality, rationally, when you have you know massive interference in uh, with criminal intent. Yes, uh, yes. Can I? Oh, may I? Yeah. No, we just wanted to. to just respond. to add a small point yeah. to this. Uh, you know, I just want since it came up repeatedly the issue of uh, documenting these things, uh, Sandesh's book, etc. Uh, see, a lot of information is being turned out in the assembly. No one looks at it, no one is studying it, no one is documenting it. And this is very authentic information, you know, at least from an official point of view, it bears certain weight. But we are the kind of society which doesn't read our own newspapers of yesterday. We've forgotten something that has come in the papers. Many years back, Matani Saldana from a building just next to this good document, you know, Goa Research Institute for Development. I mean, about Matani's politics, that's a different issue, but he had the vision to to keep it all in documentation, to preserve it, whereas we are forgetting what happened yesterday. So I don't know, newspapers are not equipped to take on this role. That's something I keep on saying and I get a lot of ill for saying it, because the newspaper's vision is 24 hours. And I've been part of it, and I know where the limitations are. Uh, politicians are not bothered with it. The university doesn't have sufficient of a Goa focus in its research. So, how do we cope with, uh, with just the mere inability to deal with our own information? I don't know. Uh, first, I just want to respond to Gerard who asked a question. Put a mic. Put a mic here. No, no, that's not a mic. That's a recorder. Gerard, uh, there is one chapter which uh, is uh, on Tirakol in, in the book. It's uh, the Tirakol. And it's a classic case of what you said. You spoke about Mopa. Kenneth is, has done more work on Mopa. Tirakol, the village is divided into half, literally. I mean, uh, the Goa Foundation has this fantastic map in their case, um, in, their, in their petition, where you can see those who have given this so-called negative declarations that is alienating their own tenancy rights and which enables a huge land grabbing exercise. And half of the village who protests and contests this. And interestingly, I, I found, I mean, one, one of the, in, in one of my studies in Tirakol, Professor Peter was there once, we almost uh, got a hint that the villagers, of course, want development. One of the main, um, one of the main uh, grouses of that villagers is it's now comprising largely of elderly people who are deeply upset that their young people are having to migrate for jobs and they would love if there was a development project that would keep their youngsters in the village, you know. So they even said they're okay with, uh, with a five-star, but we don't want a golf course. And we want to run it as a, some even suggested as a cooperative. Why were they not given an opportunity to, to do they wanted it. They wanted some opportunity to keep their young people in the village. And we, I personally don't have an answer. This is the dilemma of, of the dilemmas of development where 
we have uh, on one side uh, the need to preserve uh, and the, on the other side there are people desperate for jobs and there's a village that classically gets split in this minus I mean our chapter there is more of a chronicle I'm sorry to say but it doesn't we still haven't thought through we perhaps collectively need to think through what is the alternative um, just very quickly, I mean, this is fantastic input and comments to, to receive. Thanks everyone so much for, for all of this. It's, it's extremely good to think with. Um, just uh, on, on the Kassans, uh, it's not something I follow closely, but I had, uh, in the pre pre pandemic times, I, I had this idea to, uh, to begin looking into some of these farmers clubs that are springing up here and there in the state that try to, to reclaim and recultivate some of these Kassan lands to find out what, what's going on and what, what is driving this. And, and I, I managed uh, one day of uh, field research in early 2020 before we all had to abandon uh, India and before the whole world uh, lockdown. But it remains sort of in the back of my mind as an interest, so I, I hope to be able to have conversations in the future with all of you who are, who are experts in, in this field. Um, I mean, there's some, uh, speak, I mean, what is the market? Uh? I mean, uh, on the one hand, it's, uh, it's something that demands that all the factors of production is somehow commodified, uh, uh, including land, labor, and money. And I think it's dra that drive to commodify all the things that go into production, including land, labor, and money, which we normally don't think of as commodities, which makes much of this uh, explode often. Uh, um, another trick the market is capable of playing uh, is to make us believe that there is such a thing as the market that we can somehow break it off from what we call the state and what we call society. Uh. I think that is uh, that is misleading, and um, if if we hang on to that idea that uh, that there is something that we should be able to break it off and call a market that should function in relative isolation from what we call society and what we call the state, there are many things we won't be able to fully comprehend, uh, including the role of crime, land mafias, and all of this, which we tend to think about non-market factors interfering in the market, whereas they might actually in fact be um, integral to how the market functions, as indeed is the state, because markets are generally created by states, they don't precede states, at least the modern markets are. Uh, just as, as an A-side, I have a good, good friend, an American sociologist, who has been working on land mafias, and I think when he began, the first thing he did was to to go online and track the, the frequency of the use of the term land mafia in the mainstream English language Indian media. And there's a spike around 1991 where the, the term becomes much more common in the um, English language Indian media. And then its frequency really just explodes uh, under the UPA in particular, but also continuing uh, under, under the current dispensation. And, uh, might be because it's a, it's a catchphrase that is intuitively appealing, uh, it's catchy, it's, uh, but it's also because it actually captures something that goes on um, in the real world, a, a kind of sort of dynamic that coalesces around land and which precisely brings together these non-separate things, state market society around land. You know? Uh, I, I really appreciate the, the, the question you posed with a specific reference to, to MOPA and, and, and there, are, there are many different ways of thinking about these what, what seems like paradoxes huh? or complicated situations. I mean, to, to me, in cases of land grabbing, and here I don't mean uh, land scams or land deals, I mean instances where the state uses the power of eminent domain to take land away from people. Uh, to me, that is the fact. I mean, this possession is a fact. Everything else is a claim, a possibility, an option, uh, including jobs, investments, uh, what else promises are made. Huh? Uh, but I think if... Uh, but, but, but that is what it is. These are possibilities. Uh, these are things that may happen. Uh, but they are not facts. This possession to me remains the fact that, that that's, that's what, we, what we observe, what we see, measurable consequences on people's lives. Everything else is potential, 
but if there are not deliberate or you know, intentional policies, something put in place to make these things happen, then we fall back on a very sort of simplistic trickle down, fingers crossed, the kind of economics where we hope that a new airport will benefit people who lost their land. But if we're not putting anything in place to ensure that happens, then uh, it, it may remain a sort of a potential, potentiality, but dispossession, I think, will remain. That, that, that's the fact because that, that's happened. But it, it doesn't sort of answer your broader question, huh? which deserves more analysis. There are some questions for Tina and then we do it. So one question I had was uh, whether the, um, you see a connect between the divisive politics and the land grab. I mean, in terms of actually your study, divisive, divisive politics, politics and land grab. Yeah, whether in your studies you came across anything that showed that connect. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is as far as SEZ. Although the SEZs are gone, there are all these SEZ-like kind of uh, policies in, in, in Goa, so that study would still be relevant yeah. because you have IT Park, you have Bio, whatever, yeah. all those. And I suppose you must have the ITB Act, 16B, yes, yes, 16, yes. 16, 16A, all of these. Are. Yes, and then at, the, at, a, at another level, something that takes planning out of the scope of, like the, the National Waterways Act, the the major port authorities act, all these laws. So those those laws, I mean, uh, somewhere we need to put it all together as far as Goa is concerned. Because otherwise, what is happening is that every time there is some new law or some new project, quote unquote, we, we oppose it and then it comes in another form. It's the same wine in a different bottle. So I, I, I don't know how, but we need to be not just talking specifics in terms of like, oh, here, this land is going, that is the same. That's important. But I think the, the, the basis in terms of why we, are, we, we have concerns about it needs to get more discussed. Um, I'm, not, I'm talking now like an activist, so no, no, sorry. No, get <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, so that is another thing. But also the inequitable land relations. Yeah. Uh, now, I at one level I agree with Sauter that that uh, some of these laws have become uh, become the ex uh, the excuse or whatever you can call it for for people to sell their land uh, because they 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 are fright the landlords are afraid that if they don't sell their land and that includes the church. Uh, they, if they don't sell their land, they will get some dirt cheap rate and they won't have the land anyway. So that is true. But I think then we are not still addressing the fundamental uh, problem that there have been people who have been working off the land who have not got educated. I mean, things have changed now, no doubt, to an extent, but a lot of people are where they are in, in the social hierarchy, in the hierarchy because of the uh, because of the fact that they've been working on the land and did not have rights to those land that land but today agriculture is not uh, in that sense viable so what happens is that even clinging to that land is not going to help so so then it's like you know the the bill the power of the market or whatever you call it so 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 the it becomes a win-win. It's it's made to feel like a win-win for both the uh, the landlord and the tenant. You take 50%, I take 50%. So the tenant may not want to cultivate anymore because the entire thing is designed not to make you know sustainable agriculture possible. So so but we just have to address somewhere also the 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 inequitable land relations. We cannot overlook that issue as well. I agree that maybe some farm fields etc and farms are not as big. Some pieces of land, uh, some people who are landlords may not have huge tracts of land like you know you have in other parts of India and they may be small. But still even those small land plots of land, if somebody has been cultivating them, I think there has to be some justice there because those families have been pledged to it and we can't overlook this issue. Somewhere, otherwise, it's like the elephant in the room that we tend to uh, overlook, and that becomes then the basis for a lot of these other other problems. Yes, and the, the last uh, thing is, 
uh, also that uh, the different legal history or the different colonial history or whatever you can call it, the different history of Goa is also something we need to look, uh, we need to look at and how that different history is uh, commoditized to for for like i mean goa is like the pleasure periphery for 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 the rest of india i mean apart from the rest of the world but the rest of india so so i think that is also something that we can't uh, we can't overlook we have to look at how this different political history is uh, weaponized and last but not the least the 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 whole issue of corridorization of Goa because like I mean because it has port and because it has this it's now literally I mean almost become like a corridor and along with this other different history is also the issue of citizenship and uh, the dual citizenship issue we cannot not we cannot but have to address that issue also because it's very convenient then slowly the people who are OCIs will not be able to have land here and those OCIs are not the OCIs who, who have dreams of settling elsewhere. They are people who want to come back after after their job. They are just gone there because of their jobs. So we cannot but address the issue of dual citizenship because they don't have a voice. Because with the Citizenship Act, a le lesser known provision was about the OCIs. That there was a blanket provision that you can cancel uh, somebody's OCI card. You see, so so that means that people can't voice. They can't voice their families who may not be OCIs but may be Indian still cannot voice. So so therefore a whole say in decision making is not there. Just uh, a small a small a small interruption if you don't mind me doing it. Uh, can I request Rahul to just introduce a new book which he might maybe not aware he may not be aware of how. So it's available here and he said he just give us a word yeah. about his book. Yeah, just coincidental, I walked in with the package. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this book, uh, okay, quick introduction. I'm Rahul Basu, and I'm uh, one of the things I do is I work with Goa Foundation. Um, and I work mostly on the mining ish issues. So, this is a book by Claude and me about basically the first Goa mining case you know, between 2012 2014 and what's been happening with it and ends, I guess, yeah, it doesn't really go very deep into the uh, what happened after that, 2016, 17, all of that. And, but it also sets out how we see this uh, new idea of intergenerational equity being implemented in Goa, how we've been advocating for it and how we advocate for it uh, in general, not just in Goa, but in Goa. So some interest of history and some interest on theory, especially on the legal side. And it's available here. Thank you. Carry, carry on. Yes. Very quickly, Solana and Philip, we've talking about poor land grab. We're talking about market forces, we're talking about land mafia, we're talking about lax administration, we're talking about a lot of issues like that. But I think one thing that's very important which needs to be looked at in more detail, which I think is very relevant to Goa. So when we were doing the regional plan 21, the idea was tech land. So we came up with this concept of eco-specific zones, eco-1 and eco-2. And I remember discussion with Professor Alito on this because he felt this was dangerous. He felt this would not protect, in fact, open up more land to be converted. And his argument was we were not looking at the social aspect. He said, you are declaring people's private land as eco-sensitive one or two, taking it away, you'll be taking it away from any marketable value, unless you give them proper compensation. And I'm not talking about carbon footprints and TDS and all those aspects. Proper compensation, they will be forced to sell it to people who have the money and the contacts to get it changed, to get the land use changed from eco one or eco two. And that's exactly what's been happening since then. If you see the Amendment 16B, if you do a study, Solana, you've done all the cases, majority of the cases are in Eco 1 and Eco 2. So this is something we have to look at. Unless you look at the social aspect of planning and how it, you know, in terms of financial compensation to the individual owner of the private land, 
it's not going to work. So, and that is what we are facing now in a major extent. I think something which we need to look at in more detail. And Professor Alito pointed this out, and, and I think it's very relevant. But of course, at the time of plan, people didn't think it's important. Uh, yeah. I just want to, I just want to emphasize and sure. re-articulate what Ritu said, which, and it is food for thought, really. Um, one of the questions that uh, Ritu is saying is that when somebody else's private land gets designated as eco one, eco two, they can't, there's a limited amount of interaction with the market that is possible as a result of that. You know, so. so, what happens? Uh, all of those people are looking for, they're actively, they're, you're basically creating a kind of a voter bank that is creating a demand for a loophole. Because they're stuck with private forests being designated on their private lands. And we've seen this, I've actually documented this. I really don't know the answer uh, to this. It really requires uh, time to think about some... Uh, Rahul seems to have some this thing, so I'm going to hand it over after Louis. Uh, the, uh, but politicians came out, interestingly, put a proposal for TDRs, uh, yeah, which is deeply problematic. So I'm going to hand it to Louis and then to Rahul. So I have a couple of, uh, maybe three or four things that I'd like to speak about. I stay in Porvari. So a couple of years back, it was very strange that there was a flood in Porvari. Now, how could there be a flood in Porvari? We are right on top of the hill. We are right on top of the hill. How could there have been a flood in Porvari? But that was easy to answer because there, there, there's no more, no more drainage left. All the gutters, houses have been built on the gutters. So how is the water going to drain down? So all the water stays on top. So what are we talking about? We are talking about land use. Now, what, when you talk about land use, Land use has been there from 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, it was all practiced, it was all done, and so I happen to be a member of something called the Kumnida Fellowship. And there has been a gentleman who's been speaking on four or five occasions that we met. His name is Mr. Sadanan Malik. Now, Mr. Sadanan Malik seems to have a very thorough knowledge of just about everything that you need to know about land rights and also about all the things that have happened from very early times. So he spoke about a certain thing, for example, that there was a bilateral treaty which was signed as late as 1978 in which there is something known as saved documents. So the code of Kumnidad is a saved document and it's still in force and it has all the land uses that are required. So if you take a planta, the planta will tell you what is kazan, where is what, to the last detail, even, even for pasture of land, for every little thing, it is so highly detailed that it is as though the entire thing has been made by bees or by termites. It's perennial. You cannot be doing a project where you put concrete on the top of a hill and then where you catch, where you have to catch the rain, you actually let it slide down the, the river and ocean. That's what is happening. So we have to move back to the knowledge of our ancestors, as simple as that. It's all there. They had already shown us the way. Okay, besides that, um, so, so those documents are in force and those documents need to be addressed and there, the Supreme Court is already saying that that village community lands, native inhabitants have a right and this is not just see, if you look at anywhere in the world and you ask them um, the, anytime you talk about land, the first thing you will talk about is ownership nowhere in the world village community's land is owned people are owned by the land that is what village community land is. That is a premise that we forgot. And it's only when you understand that from deep down, then you will know that you have come from the land and the land decides about everything else because it is nature worship. The goddess of the native inhabitants of Goa is Sateri, which is symbolized by the ant hill. Similarly, everywhere in the world, if you go, it's the same thing. 
they saw they talk about the same thing how can you buy my my my, yeah. my mother there is, a, there is an article uh, just to add to what you're saying you wish that alito and alexander hen uh, anthropologists who have written a very brief article on what luis is saying the original gaunkari system that was deified that deified the land It's, it's, and it's all over the world. It's not just here. Yeah. In Maharashtra, you have the Grameen and, yeah. and so on, so forth. Every, in fact, there's a Supreme Court ruling which very, very clearly says that all village community land uh, laws have to be completely respected. And if in case there has been any kind of uh, violation, they have to be reverted back to the whatever the land use has been. So this particular safe documents, which was signed in the bilateral treaty. Are still in force, so you you got kind of you got the Quran, you got the Bible, you got the Hind, the Bhagavad Gita, and then it depends whether you want to have two wives or you want to have one or what. Then you decide which one to bring, you know, which one to bring to your rescue, either the Quran or this the Tenancy Act or Code of Kumita, or what you want to do. So it's, it's such a jumble. But let us go to the basics. No, who is the owner of the land till today? What is Form Form One Fourteen? Form One Fourteen. Is not a title document. Neither is a sale deed a title document. What is a title document? A title document is what the land use is inscribed and described. It's simple. And these things are all. I, I have to give it to Rahul, and then we'll close. But we'll have Amita. No, I just since he is talking about mining. Uh, at this moment, no, no, no. I, I want to say just relate to that because in in uh, in the Portuguese time, the, the 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 mining. I don't know which of the miners, either the Sesobo or whoever, there was supposed to be a huge amount of taxes. They got out of it because they brought out a, uh, a, a world court ruling, and world court ruling said that Goa is annexed to India by conquest. And it still stands. So there are very fundamental issues in this. What was what was conquered? Who was conquered? Was it heritage? Was the land? Was the people? Was everything was conquered, and this is what you are facing today. Uh, this is taken from the idea of the commons and the ownership of land. Basically, from what I understand, um, land was typically owned by the village deity, and the reason. Uh, was that and connected to that agricultural land was never owned by the tiller actually it was only a lease and the the reason was that if if it wasn't tilled then the population that would be supported in the village would reduce and uh, so you know you couldn't just sit on the land and this partly the reason why the community had had this thing of regularly auctioning the land uh, i just want to take it to a slightly different concept And bring in uh, Henry George and the Henry George theorem, which is from economics. Henry George is a very famous person in the late 1800s and has inspired both Singapore and Norway's development models. In fact, China also. But his basic thing was the value of land is generated by society, not by the individual. A piece of land in the middle of Panjim is worth a lot. A piece of land in the middle of the Western Ghats is not worth anything. The reason it's worth something is because of society, not because of the land owner. So his point was, you need to tax you know, the entire concept of rent. The moment you do that, what happens is that the value, the notional value of land collapses, and because you have to pay a rent for to the government as the ultimate owner, you cannot allow land to remain idle or cannot have a second home which you are not using. Because there is a significant cost to it. Now, what you can do in theory is you can. Uh, Sorry, Rahul, you cannot tax. You should tax land which is not used. You should tax all land, all land, which is zoned to be used. And the extension to that would be you could say that you can take this tax and compensate people who are not being allowed to use land, like the owners of the private forest or the ESN. Connected to this is a certain thing called the Henry George theory, which says that if there is a development project and if it's executed and designed well, then the increase in property values as a result of that infrastructure project 
is enough to finance an infrastructure project. So uh, in the 18th century, a lot of 19th century, a lot of big infrastructure in the West was developed in this model. Like I think the Brooklyn Bridge was developed on the basis of the increase in land prices Sorry. would be recycled back into funding the bridge. And it was done on a private basis. So like with the MOPA, you can say the increase in land value around it can be captured and used to finance MOPA. So there are models and which basically come back to the idea that the value of land comes from the people, it has to go back to the people and what's happening is that it's being captured by individuals and who are trading on an increasing value. So that's just something at a very high level. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a small point that we might be idealizing this past a bit too much, you know, about how the village used to own land and they used to auction it and so on. Because right now there are a lot, there are actual specific examples in Perne, in Satari, of villages where communities who have been living on the land for generations have been living on land owned by the community or owned by the local temple and they have absolutely no rights. They don't have the right to um, to build a toilet. They don't have the right for a water connection. They're being asked to do traditional uh, humiliating duties to the local temple if they're going to be allowed to build a toilet. So you know, land rights, even for people who belong to a village and have lived there for generations and are Goans, you know, by ancestry and birth and everything, are still missing. You know, so this idea of the village and the land, uh, that I mean, I totally agree that the land should belong to all the people. But the idea that Goa had it in the past is not really true because we do have these traditional systems of ownership still existing and they are very, very inequitous. They are not for they're not for the benefit of all in the same village. Uh, they're fighting, people are fighting to get to just to build a toilet and they're not being allowed to do that in, in many parts of Goa. So yeah, I just think this is a point that I think Thank everybody you. knows. Thank you. Is there any hope in something sound so gloomy? Is there hope? Where there is life, where there is life, there is hope. It is gloomy. I mean, whatever. We can inform each other. Yes. Um, thanks again so much for all of this. I mean, um, my um, my head is filling up with uh, notes for further reflection and thinking. Uh, uh, Rahul, yeah, thanks for, for bringing this up. Um, it's an important observation. I, I think also, but, but, but still, I think we need to be kept in mind. It's also the extent to which these models are can be put into practice. That has to do also with, uh, to put it in sort of old-fashioned Marxian terms, uh, that, that the balance of social forces as they work in and through the state, for instance. Uh, uh, so, I mean, to, to, to what extent these models will, will also be, I mean, it will require some, um, uh, I mean, that, that, that whole thing plays out, I think, on the terrain of social struggle and how the balance of forces is crystallized to, to become very sort of old-fashioned Marxist, but sometimes I do become an old-fashioned Marxist, especially late in the afternoon. So, now you can do any words? All I can say is thank you very much uh, for the comments and uh, actually very insightful and uh, I think we'll, we really need to think through this. I would like to think through this uh, and I'm looking at wood as well, probably in a more systematic kind of taking into account the, yeah, perhaps to, to not end this but to keep this as a project as well, as a program as well for this field. So thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. To, to, to grab the last word, uh, thank you so much for coming. You all have been a wonderful audience. Everyone is so engaged. You can make out your interest level. Uh, we are also grateful to uh, the press who has come here and focused on this very important issue for Goa. Everyone else who reads the book. Uh, we would fail in our obligation if we didn't say a big thank you to Khalil Ahmed, my friend of many, many years. So we stretch him and take advantage of him. And, uh, uh, please feel free to look around. We also one of the agendas of getting you in this crowded setting is so that we can fall over books and books can fall over us as you saw happening. And it's real fun because there's, there's so much to look around and read. 
So take your time. He's open till 8:30 or so. You can you can hang around there. The uh, copies of today's version of the book are available at a special price of just 300, which is a 50% discount. So if you want to buy it for someone, today's the day. We cannot guarantee you about tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron.